One tiny germ can make or break your entire mushroom crop. Whether you start with spores or mycelium changes everything downstream. Stick around and I'll walk through seven core transfers from spores on agar all the way back again so you know exactly which method fits your setup and your goals. What's up mushroom fam? It's Gary with Fresh From The Farm Fungi. Today I'm gonna talk about starting with spores versus mycelium. But before we get into the video, go check out our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, for highly procured cultures that have been tested by me on my farm. We have over 30 different cultures for you to select and we ship worldwide. So what's the difference between spores and mycelium? So spores are genetically distinct, dormant reproductive cells that are produced by the basidiocarp or the mushroom versus mycelium, which are genetically defined cells that are actively growing and they're part of the mushroom itself. So you can think of mycelium as the roots and the body of the mushroom it has a stable genetic makeup and spores are going to have a variable genetic makeup. They only contain half of the genes required to produce a mushroom. So the pros and cons of each spores and mycelium depends on the goal of the operator. So for instance, Spores contain genetic diversity. So if you're looking for genetic variants or you're looking to breed mushrooms, you're going to want to start with spores. However, mycelium is going to have a dominant genetic phenotype, which is the expression of the genotype that is present in that mycelium. Starting with mycelium is going to give you more consistent results it's also going to have a shelf life and be sensitive to the environment as opposed to spores, which haven't germinated yet. So they're going to be more resilient to the environment and they're going to be dormant until you trigger their germination and growth. So when should you choose spores versus mycelium? So if you're strain hunting or pheno hunting, when you're doing research, or if you're just trying to procure a strain that's more adaptive to your environment specifically. So for example, here growing in the mountains in Colorado, there is uh, at elevation less oxygen than at sea level. For me, it was of interest to procure strains that were more resilient to CO2 and low oxygen environments. And the only way to do this was to breed out spores and find phenotypes that were resilient to low oxygen environment. So the main method of utilizing spores is to go from spores onto agar. So agar is a two dimensional surface. So it's going to allow for you to observe the growth um, and make sure that it's an isolated colony. There's a few different methods to germinate spores onto agar. You can either use a swab and inoculate the spores that way. You can use a spore syringe and then inoculate a drop onto agar. Whatever method you choose, you're going to want to spread those spores evenly. So you can do a three part streak onto agar. So that means that you're going to take your initial spore inoculant, spread it out in one direction, flame sterilize your loop, and then rotate the plate about 30 degrees. Take your sterile loop and spread those spores out again and then sterilize it again. So essentially you're thinning out that line of spores. And then on the third go around, when you go to spread your spores, you can kind of uh, meander your way towards the center of the dish. And ideally 
you're going to dilute out those spores so that as they reach the center, you'll get separated colonies. And this way you can transfer those colonies onto their own Petri dish. And then you can run a trial and compare all of those phenotypes that would emerge uh, against each other and see which one fits your grow the best. So that's the way that you can start off selective breeding from spore. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but essentially you can't achieve that without starting from spore. There will be a slight lag period from when you inoculate your spores onto a Petri dish. So typically it takes about two to three weeks for a spore to germinate, to extend its hyphae and merge with a compatible spore to form mycelium. So you might inoculate spores and not see any growth for weeks at a time. Be patient and there's also ways that you can enhance spore germination like increase the temperature so ideal temperatures should be around 70 72 degrees and this will allow for good germination you can also use an antibiotic media or other selective medias that will promote the growth of just the the spores germinating compared to other contaminants that might be present in that solution Normally, I wouldn't recommend this method. However, sometimes the skill of working with auger hasn't been developed yet, or if you just don't have the proper supplies and tools, going from spore to grain could be a decent alternative. There's some risks because you won't see contamination until it emerges. So when you utilize spores to grain, just have that in mind that there's a, going to be a higher likelihood for contamination. To go from spores to grain, you have to create a spore syringe, and then you would have to inoculate that into either a grain jar or a grain bag. When you take your spore syringe and inoculate it into the grain bag, essentially what will happen is you will be creating a bunch of different phenotypes that will be competing for that same substrate. In the end, you might get a few or one or two different phenotypes that outcompete the rest, which is selecting for strong and rigorous growth. However, if there are other phenotypes that get buried or outcompeted that have other desirable traits, you'll lose out on those potentially and it doesn't really select for pinning or fruiting until later downstream. Using grain is a pro in a way that you can bypass some of the technical aspects of working with auger, but it's going to be less beneficial because you could lose out on some different phenotypes that will get outcompeted, or you might end up with a bunch of strains competing for the same resources so you might not get as good of a yield. Once you inoculate your spores into grain, you're going to want to monitor them for growth. So I recommend inoculating against the side of a grain bag or the side of a grain jar so that you can directly observe the growth. It might take a couple weeks for spores to emerge. In that meantime, you're going to want to observe for any discoloration or any weird odors that could indicate uh, bacterial contamination or mold. Once again, there's a little bit more risk when you go from spore to grain because you don't have that filter of auger in between. This is not as efficient as the other methods because there could potentially be less vital nutrients in a bulk substrate, which is selective for mushrooms, but it does limit the amount that the mycelium can develop a strong network. Going from spores into a bulk substrate could potentially work, but it might not utilize that mushroom's full potential, if that makes sense. Common bulk recipe for compost lovers is 
core vermiculite and gypsum. So these are some of the most basic ingredients. You're missing out on potentially yield and rigor of your mushroom strain at this point. One major advantage of using mycelium is that you can develop a liquid culture, which is a monoculture of already fused mycelium. And if you create a liquid culture, it grows very rapidly. It's in a 3D matrix and it has virtually no restrictions in place. You should only utilize a liquid culture that is healthy and that has been proven to fruit out in the substrates that you're going to be using. And also you should make sure that it's sterile. One good way to make sure that your mycelium is sterile is to plate it out onto agar. So as opposed to going from spore to agar, if you go from mycelium to agar, you should just have one characteristic phenotype. It should look uniform, it should be very healthy and grow uniformly on the Petri dish. So the main purpose of using mycelium to agar is to just check for sterility, but you can also observe different characteristics like the speed of growth, or if you wanna test out on different medias, you can start off by introducing those medias onto the agar and seeing how it responds. So it's a very controlled way to do experiments and to also monitor the growth and the health of your mushroom. So a liquid culture will start to grow right away since it's already healthy and established. That growth time is going to be cut down significantly. Sometimes spores can take up to two weeks just to germinate where a liquid culture is going to start growing immediately. So this is where a culture that is procured really benefits your grow operation. Going from a liquid culture to grain is going to enhance the, the speed of the grow and also the yield because it won't be competing against other phenotypes for the same nutrient source. So it's maximizing all those nutrients. It's maximizing the speed in which it's growing. And when you go into a bulk substrate, it's already going to be healthy as opposed to if you're working with spores, they're not gonna reach their full potential because they will be competing against other phenotypes in that environment. One thing that I've been curious for quite a while now is what it would take to go from a liquid culture to a bulk substrate. I believe that this is possible, but with a few caveats. So when you take a liquid culture and go onto a bulk substrate, you're introducing a lot of high density nutrients. So if this bulk substrate wasn't sterilized well, it will just be a breeding ground for contamination. However, if you compensate for this aspect, then there's the potential to cut out the grain spawn, which would increase the efficiency of your farm by a, a whole step in the process. Another aspect that could potentially be a problem from going to from LC to bulk substrate is the moisture content. So in order to make up for the lack of grain spawn, being added, you would have to add a significant amount of liquid culture in order to prevent the substrate from being overhydrated. You're going to have to calculate a drier bulk substrate in proportion to the amount of liquid culture that you would be adding. Now I haven't done this myself, but there are a few farms out there that have eliminated grain spawn by utilizing LC from retrofitted uh, bottling machines and equipment and people get really creative out there. So I think there's a lot of potential from going from liquid culture directly into bulk substrate, but you just have to amend for some of the, the moisture content problems.
So as opposed to liquid culture, you can also use an agar culture and go into grain. So it has some of the benefits of a liquid culture, except that you will know beforehand that it's definitely a clean culture because you've already gone through the quality control of starting from a Petri dish. Some of the downsides of going from agar to grain is that you have to introduce the system to a liability when you open the lid. The fact that you'll be cutting that Petri dish in the exposed air and then have to transfer that into the jar, which is exposed to the air, is the biggest risk in the process. This can be prevented by using a laminar flow hood, by flame sterilizing your blades or using fresh sterile blades, and by using best practices and utilizing aseptic technique. So lastly, bringing back full circle, you can also go from grain back to agar. So you might want to do this if you lost your library, you lost your culture library, or if you only got a new strain from grain spawn, you can, you can bring it back onto agar for long-term storage. Why would you want to revert grain to agar? If you wanted to isolate clean sectors or archive a strain for your inventory, it's a really good way to maintain that already vetted strain as opposed to going from spores. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that video on the differences between spores and mycelium. Check out our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, if you're looking for highly procured mushroom strains. We have over 30 different strains and we do ship globally. Let us know if you have any questions in the description below. And until next time, much love.